Hi there, and welcome to Telefunkian. Today's video is the third in our series on developing a MIDI kit for a vintage analog drum machine using Arduino. In this series, we're using the Roland CR8000 as our test case, where we design, program, install, and test a MIDI to trigger converter using Arduino as our development platform. While we're using the CR8000 as a prototypical vintage instrument that we would like to control with MIDI, many of the principles we're covering apply to other instruments and are especially relevant when we consider early electronic drum machines. If you missed our previous videos, be sure to check out part one and part two in this series, where we demonstrated proof of concept for our MIDI to trigger converter using Arduino, showed that we can use the Arduino and the Arduino MIDI library to read incoming MIDI data and output DIN sync and S trigger data in formats that can be used by our vintage drum machine, and designed and built a prototype on a breadboard using a DIP package microprocessor. In today's installment, we'll design and build a custom printed circuit board that will be housed in our drum machine. If this sounds interesting, stay tuned and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching. We have a lot to cover in today's video, so it's going to be a long one. First, we'll be making some changes to the program or script that we've been writing in the Arduino IDE. We'll also examine and make some improvements to our circuit before we convert the schematic to design for a printed circuit board. We'll populate our PCB and load our script into the microcontroller using the Arduino as an in-system programmer. We'll install the final build in our drum machine and test everything to make sure it's working properly. In our second installment, we ported our Arduino-based design to a bare-bones breadboard prototype using an Atmega 324 and added a feature that allows us to select the incoming MIDI channel using a combination of dip switches. We used the breadboard prototypes to show that we can send out individual drum triggers in response to different drum notes. Now we want to expand on that functionality by designing a circuit that we can use to send up to 15 different drum triggers to our drum machine, and we need an efficient way of organizing the data that relates to each. We'll do this by modifying our code to create array containers to store the GPIO pin number, trigger status, and the elapsed time of each drum trigger for each drum note. To begin with, we'll define three arrays, each with different data types. This is done in the first part of our code before the setup routine. We declare an integer array called trigger pin to hold the numbers corresponding to the 15 microcontroller pins that will be used as drum trigger outputs. The numbers here correspond with the pins I've elected to use on the Atmega 324. If you're using a different microcontroller, you might choose different pin assignments. We'll have to remember to set these as output pins in our setup routine, which we'll get to in a moment. The next array holds 15 values that are initialized as unsigned long. Unsigned long variables are extended size variables for number storage and store 32 bits in the form of four 8-bit bytes. Unlike standard longs, unsigned longs won't store negative numbers, making their range from zero to nearly 4.3 billion. This array is called start trigger millis, and as the name implies, we're going to use it to record the time at which each of our drum triggers have been started, so that we can check back from time to time to see if enough time has elapsed to satisfy our predetermined trigger duration, and if it's time to turn the trigger off. The next array is a Boolean array called triggered, and we'll use it to store the trigger status of each drum. We need to be able to tell if each trigger is on or off, so we can decide if we need to check the timing to see if we need to turn it off. We're also taking this opportunity to define the constant trigger duration, which will be set at 20 milliseconds. This is the code we'll use in our setup routine to define the trigger pins as output pins. You can see we're using pins 16 through 30. And this for loop will initialize each pin setting it high. This is necessary because if we forget to initialize triggers as high, we'll find that the first time we attempt to send a drum trigger, the drum won't sound. This is because the CR8000 drum trigger circuitry is using the descending slope of the S trigger pulse to trigger its sounds. We need to modify the my handle note on function so that it will respond appropriately to any one of our 15 MIDI drum notes. Here we use code that tells the microcontroller to respond only to those MIDI notes in the correct range, defined here as being from MIDI note 36 to 50. If the MIDI note is in the correct range, the code first turns our drum note indicator LED on then writes to the appropriate drum trigger pin to bring the pin to a logical low, thereby triggering the drum note in the drum machine. You'll recall we had previously defined the trigger pin number array, and here we're accessing that array to send the trigger to the pin that corresponds to the MIDI pitch of the drum note. Once the trigger is sent, 
The microcontroller then uses the millis function to read the trigger start time and stores it in the appropriate location in the start trigger millis array, again using the pitch to know which drum trigger and corresponding array position to use. The microcontroller then sets the state of the trigger to true, so we'll know that we need to check back and make sure we remember to turn the trigger off. This last piece of code does just that. The trigger off function is called in our main loop every time we read the MIDI data stream. The for loop checks each trigger in turn to see if any drum triggers are currently on. If the drum triggered state is true, the microcontroller checks the current time using the millis function and compares it to the trigger start time. If the drum trigger duration has elapsed, then the drum trigger is turned off by setting the trigger pin high, the drum note LED is turned off by setting it low, and the drum trigger state is set to false or off. With this code, we now have the ability to generate 15 different drum triggers, and we'll need to find a reasonably tidy way to interface with the drum machine itself. While this seems like a good time to port the project over to a printed circuit board, we might want to spend just a bit more time thinking about the implications of interfacing with the drum machine and see if there are any hardware refinements we might consider adding to the circuit used in the breadboard prototype in our last video. While our prototype used one, two, or even three drum triggers at a time, the circuit we're about to build will use 15 drum triggers, as well as the four more GPIO pins for start, stop, clock, power, and drum note LEDs. With up to 19 GPIO pins in use at any one time, we might want to consider the electrical requirements imposed on the microcontroller before we go any further. Here we can learn from the Arduino world, where there's an extensive knowledge base to be drawn from. Two of the most common areas where people run into trouble building Arduino-based systems that interface with the real world are shown here, either of which could be relevant to our project. Essentially, we want to be sure that we're not building a circuit that will create a short circuit with ground. We also want to make sure we don't do anything that might result in us exceeding the microcontroller's total current source or sync capabilities. It should be obvious that these concerns are closely related. A common mistake that can lead to an inadvertent short circuit to ground is to configure an output pin high and subsequently short that pin to ground elsewhere in the circuit. The 324, similar to most microcontrollers used in the Arduino world, can handle a maximum current of 40 milliamps per pin and is more comfortable with 20 milliamps per pin. Dead shorts could mean the end of our microcontroller. If we think about our use case, we plan to have 15 drum trigger pins set high. These pins will be connected to the drum machine's trigger outputs. When we aren't triggering the drums via MIDI, but they're being triggered by the drum machine's internal sequencer, the microcontroller trigger pins set high will be connected to the drum machine triggers, which are set low by the drum machine. The drum machine trigger outputs are buffered by the 4050 non-inverting buffers, which are likely adequate to protect the drum machine CPU, but will they do anything to protect our microcontroller from this scenario? The 4050 hex buffers used in the CR8000, similar to many buffer chips of the era, are comprised of two pairs of complementary N and P channel MOSFETs, laid out as in the schematics on your screen. As shown on the left-hand side, with a logic low input, the first P channel MOSFET at the top is turned on, while the N channel MOSFET below is turned off. This allows VCC to turn on the second N channel MOSFET and turn off the second P channel MOSFET, resulting in the output effectively being connected to ground through the second end channel MOSFET. On the right hand side, we can see the effect of a logic high, which turns off the first P channel MOSFET while turning on the first end channel MOSFET. With the first end channel MOSFET turned on, both gates in the second pair are at ground potential, turning on the second P channel MOSFET and turning off the second end channel MOSFET. So to summarize, even though these buffers isolate their inputs from the outputs, thereby protecting the drum machine CPU, the outputs are either effectively shorted to ground or shorted to VCC, depending on the input logic state. The short to ground could be especially problematic. For example, in cases where the drum machine CPU is playing a preset pattern, shorting various trigger outputs to ground, while the MIDI to trigger microcontroller is not receiving any MIDI drum notes, and all the microcontroller trigger outputs are set high. We'll come back to this problem with a solution in a moment. But before we go there, let's examine the DIN sync circuitry in the drum machine and see if it could cause us problems. When we're using our MIDI to trigger converter, switch 2, the synchro in-out switch, will be in the in position. This disconnects most of the drum machine's internal sync circuitry from the sync jack. 
Our MIDI to trigger converter is connected to the drum machine's start, stop, and clock circuits through 100K resistors, limiting the current that could pass through this circuit to less than 50 microamps at 5 volts, which is nowhere near high enough to cause us any problems. But what about when switch 2 is in the sync out position? and the MIDI to trigger converter is not being used. In this case, our MIDI to trigger converter is still installed in our drum machine and will still be receiving power. Our microcontroller sync outputs will be nominally set low. When the drum machine is running and sending its own start and clock signals, our microcontroller can act as a current sync and will draw some current from the drum machine. The path to positive 5 volts is shown on your screen, and in each case, the current is limited by a 1K resistor allowing for a maximum of 5 milliamps to flow to the microcontroller. Not enough to damage our chip. But what if we inadvertently set the drum machine sync switch to the out position and we mistakenly send start stop or clock data to the drum machine? This scenario is shown here and could manifest if, for example, the user has failed to reset the switch and or if the machine is connected to MIDI and is receiving MIDI drum notes even though the user doesn't intend to use MIDI to control the machine. In this case, we expect that our microcontroller start stop pin and clock pin will be set high. They have a path to ground inside the CR8000, but this time, in addition to the 1 kilo ohm current limiting resistor we had previously, we have another 15 kilo ohm resistor limiting the current, yielding a maximum of 300 microamp draw from our microcontroller pins, even less than the previous scenario and far less than what would be required to damage them. What about our second concern? the maximum cumulative current draw through the microcontroller. This becomes a concern anytime we have several I.O. pins set high and we draw current from each one. In our case, we'll have at least 16 pins set high when we aren't sending any drum note data. We know by looking at the 324 data sheet that the maximum current draw from the chip is 200 milliamps and that as a rule, we shouldn't draw or sync more than 100 milliamps from any one port of eight pins. The good news is that if we examine the drum machine schematic, we'll find that each of the circuits in the drum machine has its own built-in current limiting circuitry with one or more current limiting resistors ranging in value from 18K to 680 kilo ohms. So we shouldn't be drawing much current at all from the microcontroller when it's in its quiescent state. But let's return to our potential issue with shorts to ground. Our issue is that the microcontroller trigger output will be set high even when the drum machine sequencer is playing drum notes, thereby shorting our trigger pins to ground. We want to provide a way of using the microcontroller to trigger the drum machine by pulling the trigger low, but don't want the logic high presented at the trigger pin to be shorted to ground when the 4050 buffer is set low. A solution to this problem is to put a diode on each of our trigger output pins. We attach the cathode of the diode to the microcontroller trigger and the anode to the drum machine trigger input. In this way, the microcontroller trigger outputs can no longer act as a current source when they're logic high even when the 4050 has shorted the trigger to ground. But the microcontroller can sync current when it needs to, when it sends an S-trigger signal to the drum machine's voice circuitry. Similarly, inserting diodes in the run, stop, and clock output circuits can be used to similar effect. Attaching the anode of the diodes to the microcontroller and the cathodes to the run, stop, and clock inputs in the drum machine ensures that the microcontroller does not act as a current sync when not in use, and that the drum machine sequencer is generating its own start-stop signals, and yet allows the microcontroller to act as a current source when sending run-stop and clock signals to the drum machine. So with the addition of 17 diodes, we can improve our circuit and make it much more robust. This will also help with the total current demands on the microcontroller, as it will only be syncing or sourcing current when the sync triggers are being sent. If we wanted to, we could go even further by putting current limiting resistors on all of the GPIO pins. I haven't done this in this design, but let me know what you think. Should we have current limiting resistors on all of our GPIO pins? Let me know in the comments below. So with the software sorted and a few new considerations in mind for our hardware, we're ready to revisit the circuit design and port our breadboard prototype to a PCB. We're going to be keeping all of the components we used in our breadboard and adding a few more. Keep in mind that the pin numbers that you'll see in the rest of the presentation are referring to the pin numbers for the SMD package version of the Atmega 324. On our breadboard prototype, we had used the 40 pin DIP package version of the 324A, while the PCB build will utilize the TQFP44 pin PA version of the chip, 
which obviously has four more pins and different pin numbers. This is the schematic for the final project. The first area where we've added components is in the capacitors we're using to filter the power supplied to the microcontroller. While on our breadboard, we used a single 100 nanofarad film cap placed across the positive 5 volt rail and ground. On our PCB, we're going to use four multi-layer ceramic capacitors located as closely as possible on the PCB to each of the four power supply pins on the microcontroller itself. We'll complement that with a 47 microfarad electrolytic capacitor serving as a reservoir cap placed adjacent to the power supply connection where the power comes into the PCB. Immediately adjacent to that will be another 100 nanofarad multi-layer ceramic capacitor for additional filtering. Since we're not using a breadboard, we'll use headers to interface with the drum machine. We'll use a 2 by 3 mil header array as an in-system programmer interface. We'll use a 1 by 6 pin header as a power connector and to receive incoming MIDI data and send outgoing DIN sync start stop and clock data. Our last header will be a 2 by 8 16 pin boxed header that we'll use to send drum triggers to the drum machine. This header is the standard format used in Eurorack format modular synthesizers. We'll also be using this same header on the other end of the cable that connects the trigger outputs to the drum machine, and we'll come back to that a bit later. For testing purposes, we'll want to be able to reset our microcontroller, something that can easily be accomplished using a reset switch. However, to keep our part count low, we'll simply insert two pads on the PCB that will serve in place of a physical switch that will reset the PCB when shorted. The final addition will be the protection diodes we had spoken about earlier. These will be common 1N4148 diodes, which are available in surface mount packages. And you can see here that they're inserted in our circuit between the microcontroller and the various trigger and sync outputs on their respective headers. The system we'll use to design the printed circuit board for this project is Easy EDA. Easy EDA is a free and easy to use circuit design, circuit simulator, and PCB design tool that runs on your web browser. The EDA stands for Electronic Design Automation. While I do have a copy of Autodesk Eagle, another EDA package that I use for more complicated projects, I found that Easy EDA works well for smaller PCBs like this one. I quite like the way that it integrates well with JLC PCB, a company who will manufacture your PCBs for you, and with LCSC, an offshore parts vendor. I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, by the way. I'm just sharing my experience with you here for what it's worth. Easy EDA operates from within the Chrome web browser, though you'll need to create a free account to log in and use the program. Once we've logged in, we begin by laying out our schematic that you'll see here. The approach I've taken on this layout relies heavily on the use of net labels to label each pin of the microcontroller and the pins on the PCB headers, with the result being, at least in my view, that the schematic is reasonably clean and easy to follow, rather than being a confusing mass of connections. Once we have our schematic finalized, we're ready to lay out our PCB. The layout process itself is one part art and the other science, and is beyond the scope of this video. But you can see here the final result, which is a double-sided PCB, roughly 80 millimeters wide by 36 millimeters high. Of course, the EDA software allows you to select individual layers or elements within the design, which can be especially helpful when dealing with two-sided or multi-layered boards. Easy EDA also has a 3D viewer that is useful for ensuring that the final component layout makes sense and you don't have any physical conflicts, such as large components blocking access to pin headers, for example. You can see here, I've elected to place most of the blocking diodes on the rear of the PCB, while all the headers and larger components are on the top surface. The large electrolytic and ceramic capacitor are located where the power enters the board, while four more ceramic caps are located immediately adjacent to the microcontroller's power pins. The crystal oscillator load capacitors are adjacent to the crystal, while the LED dropping resistors are located next to each LED. Once you're satisfied with your PCB design, you're ready to place an order to have your PCB fabricated. Just because you may have used Easy EDA to design your PCB doesn't mean that you're tied to having your PCB manufactured by their partners at JLC PCB. PCB manufacturing is a standardized process that relies on PCB design files in the Gerber file format. The Gerber format is an open ASCII format. This is the standard used by PCB industry software to describe the printed circuit board, copper layers, circuit traces, solder mask, labels, drill data, and so on everything the manufacturer needs to know to make your PCB. 
Easy EDA exports PCB fabrication data in the Gerber format to allow fabrication of the board by essentially any vendor. To generate Gerber files from our PCB design, we have a few options in Easy EDA. From the PCB view, go under the fabrication menu and choose either PCB fabrication file Gerber or one click order PCB SMT. The program will ask you if you'd like to perform a design rule check or DRC, which you should definitely do before you place an order. Once the PCB passes the DRC, you'll be asked to either place an order with one click or to generate the Gerber. If you select one click order, the program will ask you to log into your JLC PCB account. This can be a little confusing and seems a bit redundant as you're already logged into Easy EDA and Easy EDA, JLC PCB and LC SC all use the same account name and password. So you don't need a separate account to log into JLC PCB. So either log into JLC PCB or if you prefer, and especially if you plan to order PCBs from another vendor, go back and select Generate Gerber. Your Gerber files will be generated and downloaded on your computer into your designated download folder. You can accomplish the same thing by simply selecting PCB Fabrication File Gerber from the Fabrication menu, again somewhat confusing and perhaps redundant. Assuming you plan to order your PCBs from JLC PCB, select One Click Order PCB SMT and log into your JLC PCB account. There you'll be asked to add a Gerber file and you select the zipped file you just downloaded using Easy EDA. Once your Gerber files have finished processing, you should see images of the front and back sides of your PCB. You now have the option to choose from several options, but in our case, we're going to accept all of the default settings with two exceptions. In the first case, we're going to change the background color of the PCB from green to telefunky and red. In the second case, we're going to ask JLC PCB to remove the order number from the PCB. Normally, there's a charge of $2.19 for this service, but as you can see, JLC PCB is running a promotion right now, and for some reason, my PCBs are actually being provided at no charge. All I have to do is pay for the shipping. If not for the promotion, the charge for five PCBs would have been $4.91 less than a buck a piece. The default shipping to Canada by DHL Express is several fold greater than that. JLC PCB offers a number of other shipping options, but the cheapest of these takes about a month, so I usually stick with DHL or UPS. That's really all there is to it. Once you enter your payment information, JLC PCB starts the fabrication process and you should receive your PCBs in about a week. Other manufacturers, such as PCB Way, offer similar service at similar rates, and countless other vendors can handle Gerber files exported by Easy EDA. In today's world, there just aren't that many good reasons to fabricate your own PCBs. So once we receive our PCBs and have all our parts in hand, we can assemble or populate the PCB. I'm going to run you through this very quickly you'll see that the PCB design uses a mix of surface mount and through hole components. If you're new to surface mount technology, don't be put off. With a little patience, you'll find that SMD is easy. It's been a while since I assembled anything using SMD, and in the intervening time, my solder paste dried out. I reconstituted it here with a mixture of IPA and RA flux and stirred it up until it reached a fairly uniform consistency. Really, I'm just sharing all of this to make excuses for my sloppy soldering. The bottom line though, is that if I can do this, so can you. So first things first, we usually like to start with the uh, most complex and yet the lowest profile elements on the PCB. And um, first amongst these would be our microprocessor or microcontroller chip. And there it is right there. It will be positioned like so. However, we're going to put some solder and solder paste, uh, or rather, we're going to put some solder and flux in place uh, before we begin. 
I'm checking the connections at each pin of the microcontroller, making sure they're soldered to their pads and that there are no shorts to adjacent pins. Next, I solder on the optocoupler. Then, the protection diodes on the sink outputs. Then, the protection diodes for the triggers, mounted on the back side of the PCB. Next, the 10K resistors, one at the reset circuit, another in the MIDI input circuit. Next, the 510 ohm dropping resistors for the indicator LEDs mounted right next to the LEDs themselves. Next, the 220 ohm resistor in the MIDI input circuit. The 22 picofarad load capacitors are mounted next to where the crystal will go. One hundred nanofarad multi-layer ceramic caps are used to filter the power at each microcontroller power input pin
and where the power enters the board. Forty-seven microfarad electrolytic cap is added as a reservoir cap where the power enters the board. This is the 16 megahertz crystal that the microcontroller uses to keep time. These are our indicator LEDs. This is our channel selection dip switch. The 16 pin trigger header. pin ISP header and finally the six pin header that handles power, MIDI input and sync output. After touching a few things up, we're ready to program and test the board. We'll be using an Arduino Uno as an in-system programmer to get the program from the Arduino IDE to the PCB we've just constructed. This process is described in part two of this series, where we use the Uno to program our breadboard prototype. The connections for programming the 324 on our PCB are the same, except that we'll be using the ISP header we've just installed on our board. So once we have the Arduino Uno loaded with the ISP programmer. We can connect the Uno to the target board through the ISP header. And then we need to select the destination chip, which is the Atmega 324. This is part of the Mighty Core library, so we select 324. And then under the Tools menu, we select Brownout Detection of 4.3 volts. We want a bootloader at UART 0, clock is external 16 megahertz clock. We don't retain the erasable EEPROM. LTO is disabled. We're using the standard pinout and the variant for the chip is the 324PA. So once we have all those selected and we're using again the Arduino as the ISP, we burn the bootloader. and it's done burning the bootloader. And the next thing we do is we load our CR8000 MIDI to trigger sketch and rather than uh, loading uploading using this uh, icon here, this arrow, we 
first verify that it's compiling properly and it is indeed compiling properly and then we upload using the programmer and this can be accomplished with this keyboard shortcut or by selecting under the sketch menu upload using programmer we see that that blinking light our power light which was blinking after the bootloader was loaded has gone out it's now done uploading and the run stop light is blinking and that blinking is indicating the MIDI channel as selected by this diff switch here so we've selected switch 4 on which is designating MIDI channel 8 and if I reset and restart the program 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 MIDI channel 8 and if for example I were to change the MIDI channel for example change it to MIDI channel 4 by selecting switch 3 on or why don't we select a combination we'll select MIDI channel 5 which is accomplished by turning switch 1 on and switch 3 on so we should now be on MIDI channel 5 and if we reset by shorting out these pads 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and that demonstrates to us that not only have we loaded the program into the chip but it's functioning as it should and so we're ready to install this into the drum machine one last thing before we install the project in our machine i mentioned we need a way of getting our triggers from the midi to trigger converter to the drum machine i've seen several other solutions that required a lot of soldering to various points distributed on a voice pcb the good news is that in our case, the triggers are all neatly located in a row on the main PCB, so we have an opportunity to come up with a slightly more elegant solution. This is the uh, main board out of the CR8000, and what we need to do is uh, figure out a way to access the trigger points which are presented on this 15-pin Molex connector. What I've done is I've made a... Uh, an adapter and this is an adapter which is going to hang off of the back end of this connector and it's designed to uh, piggyback on the board here and be soldered on you can see that the uh, the pins don't quite come through all the way but that's okay uh, they don't necessarily need to as long as we can get a decent solder connection there uh, that will support the uh, the connection and this little adapter board and I think with uh, 15 pins on here we should be fine but to give us a little bit more room I'm going to remove a little bit of the solder that is currently securing um, this connector in place and I'll use uh, my solder removal tool. 
this goes right in here like like so and I'll just solder that on Now we can install the MIDI to trigger converter in our drum machine. We need to locate appropriate positions on the drum machine's PCB to connect to the positive 5 volt regulated power supply and to the drum machine's ground. We also need to connect to the drum machine's DIN sync start stop and clock circuits and we'll need to configure a way of getting the MIDI data into the drum machine. For MIDI data, we're going to use a quarter inch connector mounted on the drum machine's rear panel, a solution I implemented in a previous video fitting a MIDI kit into a CR78. This will blend right in and leave the machine with a stock external appearance, though we'll need to sacrifice one of the quarter inch jacks on the back of the machine. So all of the connections we're making to the MIDI trigger are in this area here, and this gives us the ability to access the DIN sync signals that are coming in from this connector here, and also uh, the plus five volts that is generated in this portion of the power supply. And so we're coming off of that relatively close to uh, the power supply source. The first thing we'll do is we'll connect uh, the VCC from pin one to uh, R73, the right hand side of R73. And that's connected to the uh, plus five volt supply just move this uh, green wire out of the way to facilitate soldering without burning this guy. We'll put it back in a moment. Um, R73 is this uh, resistor right here. Right next to Q13. And R73 is a 10K resistor. And next we'll connect the ground. And the ground is connected to R72. Next, we'll connect the run stop to R56. Again, the right hand side. And the run stop is the fifth pin. And so it's this wire here. Again, we're connecting it to R56. R56 is right in here. just separate these just slightly more a little dab of solder there the next is to connect the tempo clock to R58 and R58 is up just on the other side of this capacitor. It's right in here. Of course, all these are labeled on the board. There we go. And then we solder the uh, actual MIDI 
connector and the way we do this will depend on the uh, polarity of the MIDI connection that you're choosing to use um, but we're using the Arturia standard which will be described in uh, some of the videos So that's that soldered in, um, installed. And then the only thing we need to do is place a ribbon cable uh, that will connect the MIDI trigger unit to the CPU board. There we go. Uh, now we can install the rest of the um, cabling and go from there. Okay, I have the uh, MIDI to trigger converter installed in the CR8000. I have not connected the trigger cable. However, the wiring is complete for the clock and the start stop. And when I turn it on, one, two, three, four, five, you'll notice five flashes, and that tells us that we're on MIDI channel five. Uh, if I go to our BeatStep Pro and I check the channels, uh, our drums are currently on channel three, so I'll move them over to channel five. And that should allow us, once we've connected this cable, to actually trigger the drums. But in the meantime, what we can do is start the clock and we instantly get the tempo here and it matches the tempo on the beat step. And I'll turn it down, 115, 110, etc., and it tracks. And so we have uh, we have the ability to uh, start and stop and track tempo. So I'll set this to an actual pattern. Uh, one of my favorites here, I think this is disco, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. And again, we see we're tracking to the beat step. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to connect this ribbon cable and that will uh, establish the connection between the, the trigger outputs and the CR8000. This is the uh, location of this ribbon cable connector right next to the trigger outs that go to the control board. So we have everything uh, connected and we're on uh, MIDI channel five and we can trigger all of our drum sounds. Kick, snare, and if we go up an octave, clave, and we have accent as well. So we have uh, a grand total of 14 drum sounds and accent for 15 triggers that are active. So we've come quite a long way from the Arduino and breadboard prototypes we featured in the first episodes in the series. 
By the end of those videos, we have made our code more efficient by using the millis function instead of delay, developed hardware and software to allow for the selection and display of one of 16 MIDI channels. In this video, we ported our prototype to a PCB and developed the software and hardware to read individual MIDI drum notes and send out individual triggers to control the 14 sounds and accent in the CR8000. We created a PCB adapter to bring the trigger signals into the drum machine, and we installed the full MIDI to trigger converter in the CR8000. That's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed this series on designing and building a MIDI kit for your vintage drum machine using Arduino. Stay tuned for future videos and consider subscribing. As always, thanks for watching. Thank you.